Well, amen. Good morning, church. How are you? You well? God is good. God is so good. I'm so just uh, excited about Jordan's baptism and testimony and what makes this morning so special on top of uh, witnessing a powerful testimony in baptism is the fact that we get to take the Lord's Supper together. Okay, and if, if you did not grab elements on your way in, if you lift your hand, uh, the deacons will come around and make sure that you have these. Uh, let me offer an invitation. The Lord's Supper is for all of those that have been born again. Okay, otherwise this is bread and simply juice. But to those of us that know him, this is our savior. This is a picture of salvation, of his broken body and his shed blood, of the new covenant that he has given to us, salvation in his name. And we take this very seriously and we take it together as a family, in community, declaring that that we believe in salvation through Jesus Christ, amen? All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 24 as we continue our walk through the book of Acts. Richard Jones spent 17 years of his life behind bars for a crime that he didn't commit. Now, even though he had a full house of alibis saying that he was at his daughter's birthday party, he was convicted of aggravated robbery in a Walmart parking lot. How did this happen? You see, this is the case of the doppelganger and the same first name. Here is Ricky Amos, the one who roughed up an old lady in a Walmart parking lot and stole her purse. And security camera was able to snatch his license plate and found out that he was driving his girlfriend's car and through some investigative research, they found his first name was Ricky. So then they searched through a database in the locals, right, for all the Ricky or Richards. And then they came across Richard Jones, whom witnesses quickly identified as the offender. 17 years because you have the same name and look so similar. Life can be filled with injustice. Business deals gone bad, betrayed by a best friend, a spouse, custody battles for the kids, sibling rivalry for dad's attention, and on and on and on. Honestly, sometimes life can seem completely unfair. Every one of us in this room has our list of examples and circumstances when life was unfair. Did you know that the Bible is filled with stories and illustrations of God's people handling the injustice of life? Joseph, 13 years in prison, sold by his brothers. Uh, David, running from Saul. None was treated more unjustly than Jesus himself. And now, Paul. Paul has been accused of crimes that he didn't commit. And he is about to spend the next five years of his life pushing against, defending himself before kings and governors the next five years. Those kings and governors are so politically motivated, it it will make you throw up. Paul's example to us in the midst of injustice gives Christians much wisdom for how you and I are called to handle the unfairness of life. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. There is no God like you who has entered in and understands the frailty of life. There is no God who understands our suffering like you. 
There is no God who has endured injustice. There is no God like you, and yet you are victorious over it all. Father, teach us this morning. Give us wisdom of life and give us you. Give us your presence above it all. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. So Luke's going to record a great amount of detail for us this morning as you go through chapter 24. And the reason is, is because it is very important from a historical perspective, all right, that Paul is shown to be innocent. Why? Because Christianity does not stand on the shoulders of criminals and thugs, okay? Right? It didn't rise out of a dark corner of delinquents. So the plot by Jews to kill Paul, as we see in chapter 23, is uncovered by Paul's nephew. Claudius Listius is the commander who was thrust upon the scene in the temple. All right, and he's now trying to figure all of this out. Last week we saw that, that he tried to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin, hoping that that would bring some clarity, but all it ended with was shouting in a heated debate, along with 40 men who've taken a vow to assassinate Paul. Claudius knows that he is above his pay grade and that he must send Paul on to the appropriate authority. That is Antonius Felix, the governor of Judea, where Pontius Pilate once stood. Paul is sent in the middle of the night on horseback, all right? That is to get away from the Jews who have taken their vow. In the middle of the night on horseback. And the details there is that there could be up to 470 men that are guarding him. All right? How's that for an escort? Along with it, Claudius sends a letter to Felix. That letter, detailed in 23, uh, chapter 23, 26 through 30, tells us that Paul is a Roman citizen that he has not been found guilty of any Roman law, that those disputes are actually internal, a theological one amongst the Jews, and three, that the Jews have attempted to assassinate him. So Paul arrives in Caesarea. His case is received by Felix, and now he must wait for his accusers who are surprised when they wake up the next morning and find that Paul is no longer there. Now, this is a perfect time for us to pause in our, our narration and discuss what history tells us about Felix as a governor, the judge who will decide Paul's fate. Felix is the only recorded governor in Roman history that was a former slave. He was an opportunist. He, uh, he, he was an opportunist without a conscience. One man described him as he practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king with all the instincts of a slave. You see, Felix used people and circumstances to carry out his own agenda. All right? He was known to take bribes, uh, to remove people out of powerful positions, and to even assassinate those who went against his interests. Now, that's a heck of a guy for Paul to have to stand before waiting for justice. Acts 24, verse 1. After five days, the high priest, Ananias, came down with some elders, with an attorney named uh, Tortillus, and brought charges to the governor against Paul. Tortullus is an attorney. Now, when you think about him, you should think less about legal procedure and the finer details of the law and more about uh, a professional speaker, okay? someone who is skilled in rhetoric. Because this case is a case of persuasion, 
subtly suggesting that the political and social implications there to Felix, right? That is, they should know, Felix should know what is clearly in his best interest, and that is to get rid of Paul. Tertullus begins with flattery, like a good lawyer, right? Since we have through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation, we acknowledge this in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. All right, slice open a roll, a big old blob of butter, smear it on there. Now, next comes the summary of the case against Paul in verses 5 through 9 of chapter 24. And this is the case. Uh, one, they charge that Paul is a world-renowned troublemaker. Verse 5, for we have found this man to be a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension amongst all the Jews throughout the world. The Romans hated unrest. The Roman Empire outlasted the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all because they were able to keep the peace. That stability allowed them to collect taxes. And a regional leader's job was to squash unrest, maintain civil order, even if it meant the miscarriage of justice, just squash it. And if a governor couldn't do his job, he would get removed, as we will learn in a moment about Felix's predecessor. So Tertullus suggests that Paul has stirred up trouble throughout the Roman Empire. We should dispose of him to keep the peace. Charge number two. Paul is a leader of a dangerous anti-Roman cult, verse 5b, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. Now, Rome had a list of approved religions that you could have, and they demanded okay, allegiance to the Roman gods because it was seen as allegiance to the empire, kind of like saluting the flag, showing your patriotism. Nero was Caesar at the time. He and Caligula okay, were notorious for demanding to be worshipped as if they were a demigod. Okay? And they were brutal against any who refused to worship him. Now, so suggesting that Paul's a ringleader of an unapproved sect becomes very dangerous for Paul. And charge number three, that is, that Paul tried to desecrate the temple. Look at verse six. And he even tried to desecrate the temple, and then we arrested him. Now, here's the deal. Felix would find this charge with an ominous ring to it. You see, Felix's predecessor, uh, Cumanus, he was convicted and banished over an incident involving the Jewish temple. So during the Passover, several uh, years back, Cumanus posted Roman troops on the rooftop around the perimeter of the temple complex. Now, according to Josephus, one of the soldiers pulled back his garment and squatted down in an indecent manner. You get what's going on here? And shouted something vile that went along with that indecent gesture, sparking a riot. And in that day, many Jewish worshipers died beginning a long feud there between Cumanus and the Jewish leaders. And ultimately, Cumanus, as governor, was convicted and banished. So when Felix hears the charges, 
that Paul has defiled the temple, he immediately realizes how much political weight those charges carry. Listen, Felix, we tried to handle this on ourselves. We were going to kill the man. And then you guys stepped in. You see, these are powerful men. High priests and other well-known Sadducees. Powerful men that you wanted in your favor. If you were going to govern in Judea for very long, you needed them. And so as Tertullus rest his case, Basically, guys, we can all agree, let's get rid of this pest of a man named Paul. So with the room stacked against him, it is now Paul's chance to respond. And classic Paul, he offers no flattery. Look at verse 10. When the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Guys, this is equivalent to seeing a friend's brand new baby, right? And your reply is, oh, that's a baby. (laughs) Okay, that's what he says here. You've been the judge of the nation. That's as much as I can acknowledge. And then he gets right to his defense. Charge one, right? And that is, Paul, you're a a world-renowned troublemaker. Verse 11, he says, guys, I arrived in Jerusalem 12 days ago. All right, Felix knows he spent the last five days in custody with him. That only leaves a week. I've only been here a week. Verse 12, neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city itself did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. Paul wasn't teaching. He wasn't even proselytizing. He was in the temple praying and fasting for seven days with four other men who were completing a Nazarite vow. In other words, he was minding his own business. He wasn't even involved in discussions. Verse 13, Paul says, nor can they prove to you the charges which they now accuse me. In verses 14 through 16, Paul moves on to the second charge. Okay, the second charge, remember, he is a leader of a dangerous anti-Roman cult. Paul's main point here in verses 14 through 16 is that he is a Jew. And this is a theological debate within Judaism. Listen, he says, I serve the God of our fathers. I believe everything in the scripture. The Hebrew God is my hope. And I believe in the resurrection. He even closes with verse 16. In view of this, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men. You see, Paul's counterpoint is, guys, I'm a Jew, which is a recognized religion of Rome. I'm not a political threat to Rome. Rather, this is a theological issue within Judaism. And then finally, Paul turns to the third charge, that he had defiled the temple. So in verse 17, he tells them, look, I came to bring alms, an offering to the poor of Jerusalem, by the way, who are my people. Does that sound like the actions of someone who's defiling the temple? And while I was at the temple, I was actually presenting offerings. In fact, verse 18, I had just finished a Nazarite vow and was purified. That's what I was doing in the temple without crowd, without commotion, without any of that. He goes on to say, verse 18, there were some Jews from Asia, by the way, who ought to have been present before you and to make accusation if they have anything against me. Or let these men here themselves tell what misty they have found as I stood before the council. In other words, Governor Felix, 
the men who actually stirred all of this up aren't even here. And so Paul finishes with, guys, the real reason I'm here is because I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's why I'm on trial. Now, we're going to come back to how Felix responds in this case next week, okay? But for our purposes this morning, remember, Paul is going to spend the next five years of his life fighting unjust charges, not able to travel freely, not able to check on the churches that he planted, not able to continue on the new frontier and to plant new churches. Rather, he had to wait. That's like a cuss word to a Christian, wait. He had to wait, responding to bogus charges. His Fate is in the hands of godless, sinful men. And he is helpless and powerless. So I said at the beginning, we may not face the exact same situation that Paul does here, but every one of us faces injustice in life, unfair situations being betrayed or double-crossed by a business partner, having to endure our name or reputation being drugged through the mud in the court of public opinion. Worse, it might be in an actual court before an actual judge. The injustice in our families or at work the feeling that we got a raw end of the deal or a bad hand at life. So what principles can we actually learn and apply from Paul? Okay, there are gonna be four. Number one, Paul fought for justice. Okay, he fought, he was not fatalistic. He fought against the charges with a logical defense, okay? Previously, we saw him avoid persecution by not getting on a ship that he knew he would be killed, okay? Here, he tells the commander about an assassination plot against him. Paul played the Roman citizen card because he invoked his legal rights, and now, standing before the governor, he gives a reasoned, logical response and defense. Now, I point this out because Paul did not roll over and simply take the injustice. He fought. Beloved, when crimes or abuses are against you, get safe. Seek wise counsel and protect yourself legally. Upon arrival at my last church, I walked into a very vulnerable situation. There was a, a particular man who was in leadership and it quickly became apparent that he should not be in leadership because multiple times he blew up in irrational, uncontrollable ways in different church meetings. And I had him removed. He was just removed from leadership position and him and his wife continued attending the church until there was a, another particular incident that occurred at the church where I actually began to see, receive death threats. He tried to fight me, had to be separated, and then I received death threats. Do you know what I did? I went to the police, okay? That is, there was a restraining order around the church and my house. Now, I tell you all of this because there has been tragic abuse of Jesus' teaching to turn the other cheek 
falsely applying that Jesus wants us to simply take abuse of a dominant abuser. Okay? As if you're getting mugged and they steal your wallet and you're supposed to turn the other cheek by going, hey, I could take you to the ATM and we could pull out some more money. So listen with me. Take notice about exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 39. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Why does Jesus say the right cheek? Well, in the ancient world, I mean, most people are predominantly right-handed, okay? But in the ancient world, even if you were born left-handed, you know what they did? They turned you into a righty, okay? It's like, we don't need any lefties. Everyone is a righty. If you are getting struck on the right cheek by someone right-handed, that is actually a backhanded slap. In other words, this is an insult, not a beatdown. You understand that? Jesus is not telling you, get absolutely waylaid and just keep taking it. Furthermore, guys, as we are allowed to fight for justice, can I just remind you that emotions are okay? Okay, you remember Paul last week when he got punched in the mouth uh, as he was standing before the high priest and the high priest said, punch him in the mouth. Paul was furious. He was angry. Be angry, yet do not sin. David was unjustly pursued by King Saul. Guys, the Psalms are filled with the emotions of anger and self-pity, of rising up, of crying out for justice. You see, the Psalms are filled with David giving those emotions to God. And beloved, that is where we must take them. All right, so fight for justice. Number two, fight righteously. Paul fought with the truth and he never compromised his character. Fight righteously. Do not slander, do not scheme, do not deceive. That's everything we see Paul's opponents doing with threats of intimidation. Why? Because they have no character. And they're actually delusional in the fact that they think they are in control. Christian, consider your witness. Consider the name of Christ. The ends do not justify the means. If the means include compromising your character. Do you guys believe that character matters? Well, look at that. Do you guys believe that character matters? For real. I mean, from the pulpit, from the leaders that we vote for. Because I could get on a soapbox about how culturally we have chosen charisma over character. Number three, leave room for the vengeance of the Lord. Romans 12, 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, the reason that you can stop short of compromising your character is because you leave room for the Lord to fight on your behalf. Again, we come to the spot where I need to, to, to set up guardrails Okay, so there's the guardrail of fatalism. That is, you just sit back and do nothing, and whatever comes, comes, right? So I pressed against that. But the guardrail on the other side is the false belief that you are in control. You're not. He is in control. It is not all up to you. You see, it's easy to see in Paul's life, isn't it? 
as he sits here wasting away for five years of his life. But as you read it, who would you say is ultimately in control? Well, you would say God is. Even above the evil Jewish leaders and the wicked governors, God is above them all. Hear me. God hates the injustice that was done to you. He hates it more than you do. He is infinitely more righteous, hates sin infinitely more. And he has said there is a day when he will bring all things to light and make everything right. Leave room for the Lord. And four, and finally, Wait for him. This is the hardest part, waiting. You see, we want victory. We want resolution now, now. But beloved, God wants you to draw near to him and wait on his timing. Do not lose hope and stop trusting because you are behind at the end of the first quarter. The game's not over. The game's not over. Joseph unjustly spent 13 years of his life in prison because his brothers were envious. That is injustice. And just because he was behind at halftime And it looked like his life was wasted with no redemption. He trusted. He waited on the Lord. And God exalted him to the number two in all of Egypt. So as you wait for justice, hear me. Wait for him. You are not alone in your suffering. And in your waiting, there is no God like him who knows and understands. He is near. Who can understand your suffering more than Jesus? And his presence is your only sustaining grace. You hear that? His presence is the only thing that will sustain you. Listen to Psalm 62, verse five. My soul, wait in silence for God only. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, and I will not be shaken. So now this morning, as we move towards the Lord's Supper, catch this, we turn to him who was treated unjustly for our sin. His injustice was because of us. So I want you to prepare the bread so that we can take it together. Scripture tells us that the night of Jesus' betrayal, he had one final supper, the Passover supper, with his disciples, and he took bread, and as he broke it, he said, this is my body that has been broken for you. You see, our sin, our iniquity has been placed upon him. So I want to give you just a few moments in the quietness of your heart to prepare your heart to take the bread rightly with a heart of contrition 
knowing that your Lord and Savior took on your injustice. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now as you prepare the cup, The scripture says the cup is his covenant in his blood. And it is also a symbol of the victory that Christ gives. Did you know he willingly laid down his life for our sin? He willingly was treated unjustly on your behalf. There's no God like our God who enters in, who knows, and who understands like him. He will give you strength to long suffer. He will ultimately give you victory. And in the interim, he gives you himself so as you hold the cup I'm going to give you a few moments I want you to press into and celebrate the nearness of Jesus Christ And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of our sins. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Jesus. You are our king, you are our savior. We praise you this morning that you are a God who enters into our suffering, that you are a God that we can trust, that you will one day make all things right. We trust you. We believe you. How could we not? You you have given yourself for us, for our sin. You have drawn near to us so that we might know you intimately and walk with you. Father, I pray that you would give us strength that comes from you and from you alone. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in our lives as we fight for justice and as we wait on you. Father, give us the strength of character, the strength of character that maintains itself, that walks worthy before you, that will not compromise because we know you are fighting for us. You are our hope. You are our joy above every other thing. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited. In fact, you're commanded to respond. Guys, you've seen a picture of the gospel in baptism. You've heard Jordan's testimony about what the Spirit has done.
We've seen the picture of the gospel in the Lord's Supper, his broken body, his shed blood. As you've heard God's word this morning, what must you do to respond? What does that look like? In these next few moments, I pray that you would, in obedience, respond to the Lord. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Do not carry your burdens alone. We would love to pray with you. If you want to use this stage as an altar to pour out your heart before the Lord, I pray that you have the freedom to do so. Whatever the Spirit of God has said to you, you be obedient.